And uh, we've been doing this leadership series on the weekend, specifically talking about leadership in the church. Let me reiterate kind of the common theme. Uh, we're changing our mindset from just being volunteers in the church. We don't just volunteer at church. You're not a volunteer. You are part of the body, You're part of the body. The body functions. The body does things. My hands are moving. My fingers are moving. My brain is thinking, my ears are listening, my mouth is moving. The body does things, right? And you are part of the body. You're not just a volunteer in an organization or volunteering for the PTA. You're part of the body. You're part of the kingdom of God. And the body, Christ is the head. He's the head. But you're the body. We are the body. And I want you to hear that. Now, I'm going to read a verse to you, and I might mess with your theology a little bit, but not too much. I think you'll come to the realization once we read this and we take it in context. You know how sometimes you take a scripture that sounds good, you take it out of context and it preaches and it works, but you took it out of context from what the original meaning was. This might be one of those. I'm going to read this, these verses, three verses to you. It's in John chapter 14. This is Jesus talking right here, and I want you to hear what Jesus says. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. One translation says, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you for myself where I am. There you may also be. You know, verse 4 says this, and you know the way to where I'm going. When you hear that verse, when you hear those series of verses, if you're anything like me, what do you typically think of? What do you think of? You get shouted out. There's no, you're going you're gonna to get it right. Heaven. Yeah, you think of heaven, don't you? I think of funerals. Because I I read that scripture at funerals hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times I've read that at funerals. And I think of heaven because it sounds like he's talking about heaven. However, in context, let's go back, John chapter 13. He's not, first of all, let me tell you where he's not. He's not gone to the cross yet. He's not died for your sins yet. He's not risen from the grave yet. He is preparing his disciples in this conversation for going to the cross. I want you to read this in context. Chapter 13, the Lord's Supper. John chapter 13, he's doing the Lord's Supper with the disciples. They're doing communion. Verse 5 of John chapter 13, he's showing. Here he is getting ready to go to the cross just the next day getting ready to go to the cross. And what is he doing? He's washing the feet of the disciples. He's getting down and washing. What he's doing is he's showing servanthood and love and the highest priority in our lives is when we lay our lives down and we serve other people. So he's doing the Lord's Supper. He's washing the disciples' feet. And then he's predicting his betrayal. He's going, one of you guys are going to betray me. And you know the story. It was Judas. And then it comes to this place. And by the way, let me just tell you about the washing of the feet. He comes to Peter and he says, Peter, Peter's going, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter says, no, not mine. I, I, I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy of that. And he goes, well, if I don't do it, you're not worthy of being in my kingdom. Well, in that case, Peter, the, the good news about Peter is Peter gives hope for all of us. Because Peter walked around with his foot in his mouth three-fourths of the time, right? And when he wasn't doing that, he was acting before he actually was thinking, there is hope for me. Is there hope for you too? Thank you, Peter. Yeah. And so anyway, he's washing and uh, washing the disciples' feet, showing servanthood. And then he comes to this verse, and then he talks about oneness with the Father and then he talks about the role of the Spirit. So in context, let's possibly rethink this. He's talking about going to the cross, 
And in my father's house, when you read what he's talking about, he's talking about his father's house being him. Where did the father live? In Jesus. The father couldn't live in, the Holy Spirit couldn't live. He talked about the role of the spirit after that. He couldn't live in us yet because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross. Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. Could it be that in context, Jesus was revealing a deep truth that the house was Jesus? Because Paul comes along in the New Testament, three-fourths of the New Testament, and you see it time after time after time after time, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And we find out after he is raised from the dead, Jesus is talking about even before uh, with Nicodemus, he talks about being born again by being in Christ and receiving the new birth. So what he's talking about here is he's talking about, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where is that place? I'm gonna just tell you the shortcut. It's in his body, in his kingdom. Now, I'll reveal this to you through some other, through some other uh, scriptures that Paul teaches us, but here's where, here's where this comes into play. You are part of the body. I said that in the very beginning. You're part of the body. The body is where Christ is the head. We so often think of Jesus being separate than us, and yet we are in Christ. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, you are now part of the body. And this gets, this gets really, really good when you realize you're part of the body. Now, let, let me explain something to you. I go to bed every night. I lay down. I put my head on the pillow. And my pinky starts telling my brain, I'm upset. I wanted to be a left knee. I mean, I really want to be a left knee. And you haven't listened to me all day. I'm sick of being a pinky. I want to be a left knee. You know that's not true. I lay down. I put my head on the pillow at night and I go right to sleep. My body doesn't have envy for like the pinky doesn't say, I should have been an index finger. My index finger doesn't say, I should have been the brain. I have no competitiveness from body parts. I have, my, my brain never says, I wish I could have just been a little toe and not done nothing. You make me work so hard. No, it doesn't do that, does it? Why? Because it does what it was functioned to do. My brain does what it was created to do. My little left pinky does what it was created to do. My right knee does what it was created to do. And I want to just tell you something. The body of Christ, you all are different, but you're part of the body. The whole body is loved equally, but y'all serve a different part, a different role in the body. Okay, so I want to take you to some teaching. Now, I brought the big book tonight, the big book. So there must be more power because there's red letters in here. And those are the words of Jesus. But anyway, I wanted to read John for you. I want to read a couple more verses because sometimes we forget this about Jesus himself. Jesus was, was his earthly name. He wasn't Jesus until he showed up during that 33 and a half years. He was only Jesus during the 33 and a half years. Before then, he was known as, his name was the Word. In fact, we think of this. We say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We do it at communion time. Sometimes we do it at baptism all the time. But really, he wasn't the Son until he was sent here. He was God himself. Listen to this. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 6 says this, there are three witnesses in heaven. His heavenly name is the Word. There are three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. 
somebody said, really? It's kind of like one of those things where uh, you thought it was always this way until you stop and look at it. What's that principle called? What's that? Anybody help me out? Taylor, you know where they, uh, um, uh, where the Ford logo, they have, this is an example of it. You have two Ford logos and you'll pick the wrong one thinking that's it, but it's the other one. Anyway, it's like that with the word. You oftentimes pick the wrong one thinking it says Father, Son, and Spirit. It says Father, the Word. Now, how, is Jesus' eternal name the Word? Absolutely. Go to the book of John. The very, very, very first thing it says to the book of John is, in the beginning, before all time existed, the Word And the Word, watch this, was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we often separate the Father, the Word, or the Son, Christ, and the Spirit. We often put too big of a separation between them. But it's kind of like you, you, yourself. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. And we don't walk around looking at you and separating you going, well, that's your body. That's your body talking. We don't have too many conversations like that. We don't say, well, dude, that's your soul. And, and get over there. No, you're one, you're one. Even though you have distinct parts, you're one, right? That's the best way we can describe the Trinity, and we still fall short in describing the Trinity. But I want, you to ch- I want to challenge your thinking for just a minute, because if you get this revelation we've been talking about, we're going to see the revival. I believe we're going to see the revival that we've been believing for for many, many years. The Word was God Himself. So the Word, the Word of life, the Word... We know him as Jesus because he shows up and he becomes a man. Listen to what Philippians chapter 2 says. Christ was truly God. Philippians 2 verse 6. Christ was truly God, but he did not come into earth. He did not try to remain equal with God. Instead, he gave up everything. He emptied himself and became a slave, a servant to be like one of us. Christ was humble. He obeyed the Father and even died on the cross. Now, the good, the God's Word translation actually says that heaven emptied itself into humanity. This is amazing because what does that look like? An empty heaven? Heaven's a real place. And for 33 and a half years, heaven emptied itself into Christ. What did Jesus say when he was here? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Ah, so God shows up. He was all God. This is the mystery. He was all God, full God, and yet full man. He didn't take advantage of his Godheadship while he was here, although he was God in flesh. Isaiah prophesied about the coming of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, why is this important to get this revelation? Because I preach on this all the time and I say it different ways. The importance of you and I knowing our identity of who we are. You're not a loser. There's nothing to be afraid of. Yes, you're a human being, but you've been brought into the family, part of the body, so that he, through his spirit, could own you, even though you have a free will, possess you in a good possession way and do ministry through you. 
you're part of the body. So we don't have a body that's dysfunctional. We've got a body that flows, that works, that does what it's created to do, a body, the body of Christ. We don't argue with one another. Wouldn't it be weird if I was walking down the street and my left hand just go, boom. <laughs> what was that? Wasn't even my left hand. They got confused. We don't do that. We walk. We were on mission. We're on point. We're doing what we were created to do. We're doing what? Work. You know, sometimes when I have a, a little bit of anxiety in my, in my head or in my soul going on, you know, one of the best things, one of the best therapies for me is getting up and accomplishing something, going to work, just working it out. And as I work, I feel a sense of satisfaction. I feel, I feel a sense of accomplishment. I feel like I've done something. And in doing so, it's therapeutic because I'm doing what I was created to do. And the body, us, we're not separate from God. We're part of his family, part of his body. So Hebrews says, the reason I want you to understand this is because sometimes we think it's a certain way when it's really better than the way we had previously described it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says this, let's hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel the sympathy of our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way as we are, but did not sin. Verse 16, this is the one I wanted to get to. Let us therefore have confidence as we approach God's throne where there is grace, there we will receive and obtain mercy and find grace, just the help we need when we need it. Now, this is exciting because here's what it says. It says, we obtain, when you go to the throne room, you obtain mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is you not getting what you deserve, that you can go right into the throne room. I deserve, here's what I deserve. I deserve hell. I deserve death. I deserve punishment. But there, when I go into the throne room, and I do that through prayer, I do that through intentionally going into his presence, and I can do it anytime, anywhere. And when I do that, guess what? It says there, I obtain. I obtain it just by going into his presence. But I find grace. That's a big difference. He says, you obtain it by getting in his presence. There's mercy in his presence not getting what you deserve. But grace is different. You find grace, and grace is is getting, getting, and getting what you don't deserve. You don't deserve the grace of God, the gift of God. There's a distinct difference. Mercy is, I'm not going to harm you. I'm not going to make you pay. That's mercy. Grace is found and it's revealed. Now, here's the cool thing about grace. Grace is not a one-time event. We think of grace as being, well, I got grace when I got saved. And yes, that was the start of it. But every day that you live life, you find more grace. Grace is a gift. It's relationship. It's love. The grace of God is the favor of God. The grace of God is the ability of God. It's the gift of God. The grace of God shows up in your life and opens doors for you. The grace of God, by the way, the grace of God is you and me being in relationship with one another, us. You're, you're a grace gift to me. You're a grace gift to the person sitting next to you. This is why the body is so important. So let's move on. Jesus faced the same temptation we did, and he created a place in his body, a mansion in his body, different houses, different rooms. You all have different grace gifts. You don't all look the same. But as he he fills his body with the grace gifts, I want you to see this. Well, let me ask you a question. This is a question you need to ask yourself. What is your grace potential? 
Because what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to compare. You know, like I said, my little finger was arguing about wanting to be the left knee. We do that with one another, oftentimes in the body. Let's talk about it in the natural. We do it with different gifts and talents. We're all different, differently gifted, differently talented. You know, when I was growing up, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls were the thing, right? They just kept winning championship after championship. And Michael Jordan had this amazing talent, and it became his logo of from the half court, running to the half court, and just somehow he could defy gravity, float through the air, and dunk the basketball. Now, I played basketball, and I loved basketball in the fifth grade and the sixth grade, but I was no Michael Jordan. When I got into the seventh grade, I played organized basketball for my school, my junior high school, and I hated it. (laughs) I loved the game, but I hated the coach. He was so, forgive me for hating, but I hated that man. He was so hard, he was so harsh, he was so mean. He helped me realize I wasn't grace gifted in this area, and he for sure let me know it. (laughs) Come on. Had I had Michael's talent and ability, I probably would not be here speaking to you tonight. Where would I be? Somebody say, on the golf course, (laughs) cash and checks. My whole point is this, God has gifted each one of us in different ways. And it's, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, it's unwise when we compare ourselves to others. What we often do is we find people better than us and we feel bad about ourselves. Just look at Instagram, Facebook. Man, you wanna get depressed. Look at that in the wrong way, right? Anyway, we compare ourselves with ourselves, and and then when we want to feel good about ourselves, we go, well, I'm doing way better than them. I mean, I'm doing better. And you are, probably. And you can feel good about yourself. However, if you want to compare yourself, I give you permission to compare yourself against your potential not other people, because you have potential. Maybe you are better than someone over here. Maybe you're doing better. But maybe compared to your own potential, you might be doing horrible. I like to say this, there's way more on the inside of you than you've tapped into yet. Now, let me get back to this. Finding the grace of God, finding it, It's a search, and by every day that you live for Jesus, you're going to discover new graces, new gifts, and new talents, and new strength, and new ability, new favor of God. I declare that he make his face to shine upon you. What is that? That's the favor of God. That's open doors. That's you walking into them. And by the way, there's going to be times where you discover grace gifts on the inside of you that you did not even know existed until you reached for potential and you have to use your faith to do it. And when you reach with your faith and you reach for something new, and sometimes, by the way, don't be, uh, don't think it peculiar if it scares you, it probably will. Gideon, Abraham, Moses, you want me to lead these people? I, 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 don't, I don't even speak publicly. That was me. I stuttered as a child. I, it, it, and as a result of it, became what I self-identified as shy. And it wasn't until my dad said to me, Darren, I am out of town this coming midweek service. You're speaking. 
which the Lord had already been telling me that was going to happen, but I had never told anybody else. Dad said, you're speaking. I said, and I told my dad, I said, no, I can't do that. I don't do that. I've never done that. Don't want to do that. No. He said, Darren, you can do it. You have to do it. There is no one else. You have to do it. I said, Dad, no. I did it and found out there was grace, God's ability to do it. And I'm going, oh, where is this coming from? How is this happening? Scaring the stuff out of me. And after I was done, I said, I love that, but I'll never do it again. <laughs> but then the affirmation and the confirmation came on the backside of that. Darren, I recognize a gift on the inside of you came from multiple people. And I'm going, really? I didn't see that one. Now, I, I could keep talking about that, but I want to talk about you for just a second. Here's what I know about you. There are things on the inside of you. For some of you, it may be businesses. Others, it might be creativity. It could be teaching. It could be communication. It could be something that you've never thought of. But as you walk through life, God's going to test you. He's going to challenge you. Not test you and like pass or fail. He's going to test you like, will you obey me in this thing? Come on. Obey me. He's going to cheer you on. Come on, obey me in this. And then you're going to end up discovering that there's a gift on the inside of you that you didn't even know existed. Amen. And then every day, the grace gift begins to flourish. It begins to blossom. It begins to become not only a, a, a reveal to you, but it becomes a reveal to us because your gift really isn't for you anyway. Right. Your gift is for everybody else. Ephesians chapter 4, it's the famous verses where he talks about the gifts that he gave to men, the body of Christ. It's the fivefold ministry. But then listen to what he says in verse 7. Each one of us, that's everyone in the room, everybody in the room, each one of us is granted his own grace as determined. Who determines it? as determined by the full measure of Christ's gift to us. The New Contemporary Version says it this way, Christ gave each one of us a special gift of grace, showing us how generous he is. So here's what I want you to open your mind to. You all have a different grace gift. And it's not supposed to look like anybody else's. I'm not supposed to look like Billy Graham or T.D. Jakes, and I love both of them. I wouldn't mind looking just like either one of them. I'd love it. But guess what? I rob the world when I want to be those two guys or anybody else. I rob the world of the one and only Darren Karstens, me being me, and by the way, you being you. You're special to us. We're, we're not all identical. Oh, we're loved equally. His love is equal. Amen. Verse 12 in Ephesians 4, it says, He did all this to prepare all of God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ, that in our oneness in faith and our knowledge of the Son of God, we shall become mature, reaching the very height of Christ's full stature. What a tall order. You're going to reach the full order and maturity of Christ's stature. What's that look like? Well, we had our... We had six, we have six grandchildren, okay? We had all six of them over all day Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, we had the other five. Uh, one went home, we had the other ones. Now, here's what I know. These kids are the sweetest kids, but I was reminded of something about maturity and immaturity, okay? They're sweet kids, but they're kids, do you know the difference between a mature person and an immature person? 
is that the mature person realizes that out of love, you sacrifice and serve. You take responsibility, discipline. I didn't want to get up at 5.30 in the morning when that noise started in the house. But guess what? I did. I wanted to behave just like them and go, you know what? My immaturity is going to let me sleep where your immaturity is waking everybody else up. But no, we get up, right? A sign of maturity is when you can set aside your own feelings, your own emotions, and you can serve those around you when it doesn't feel good, when it doesn't feel right, when out of love and out of discipline, you're getting ready to go to the cross the next day and what are you doing? You're washing the feet of those around you. Metaphorically speaking, you're washing the feet of those. Immaturity says, it's all about me. Could you give me some more attention? Could you meet my needs? Could you make this whole thing function around me? That's a sign of immaturity. And immaturity gets jealous. The kids, one had this toy, the other had this toy. And what do they do? Same thing all kids do. I want that one. It's my turn. Right? And then they take it. As adults, we can remain immature. Going around the mountain, going around the mountain. You can stay immature the rest of your life if you want to. But being part of the body, this is just good stuff right here. Because what I'm talking about is I'm talking about seeing God move and enjoy church in such a way that there is a revival of people just, I I know we're having some of it now. We're having people get saved all the time. We're having people being healed physically. By the way, Jesus is still a healer. He was a healer when he was the word in heaven before he was named Jesus. He was a healer 33 and a half years showing what the heart of the Father is like. I'm a healer, and he's healing today. Be open, have faith. In his own hometown, he couldn't do many miracles because, well, that's just Jesus, Carpenter's son. We respect him as the Word. Mm-hmm. Let's believe him. Let's believe him. Let's grow up. Romans chapter 12, just a couple more. For by grace given to me, Paul says... Every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. How? In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And then he goes into this thing. We are all parts of one body, verse 4. He says you're members and you don't all have the same function. So in Christ, there's that in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. The member of my little finger belongs to the hand. The hand belongs to the arm. The arm belongs to the shoulder. We could sing it with, we could sing that song, couldn't we? It says in verse 6, we all have different gifts according to the grace of given us. Grace is what? Grace is God's ability. So don't ever get jealous of another gift. You're going to be judged in heaven, not on how someone else performed. You're and not judged. You won't be condemned, but rewarded. Judgment meaning reward. You're going to be rewarded in heaven according to how well you reached your potential grace gift on the inside of you. So as we walk forward, as we look forward, there's all kinds of different ways that the body can minister. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, there are all different ways that God works through his people, but the same spirit God works in all of us in everything we do. Something from the spirit, verse seven, can be seen in each person for the common good. So here's the way it it looks. We can find you. Maybe you've never been public. Maybe you've been quiet. 
We could pull you aside and we could look at you and go, there's something so special about you. You are God's gift to us and you function in this way. (laughs) This is good. And here's the satisfaction of this. You don't need to be anybody else other than who God made you to be. And by the way, let me just give you this little nugget. When you have a, uh, an envy for someone else's gift or grace, every grace gift comes with its own adversity. And you may say, I would, like in the natural, you might say it this way, I wouldn't put up with that man for one minute. I don't know how she does it. I'll tell you exactly how she does it. She's grace gifted to put up with that guy. We could reverse it, but you get it. Oh my goodness, I couldn't raise those kids. Well, no, you couldn't, but they could. And guess what? They probably couldn't raise your kids either. You're grace gifted for them, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says this. By faith, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. We'll wrap it up with this one, I believe. Uh, By faith, we understand the world during the successive ages were framed and fashioned and put into order and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. So that what we see was not made out of the things that are visible. In other words, he says in a couple different places, The things that we see were made from the invisible by faith. Well, what I love about this is Hebrews chapter 11. This is another one of those verses that you kind of have to read it in context because it sounds like he's talking about the universe, the world, the moon, the stars, and he is, but he's doing a double meaning. He's using an illustration to talk about your world because he's talking about the heroes of our faith, the fathers of our faith, he, he is because he says in, in verse 1, now faith means putting our full confidence in the things we hope for. It's being certain of the things we don't see. It's the kind of faith that won the reputation of the saints of old. It is, after all, only by faith that our minds accept as fact the whole scheme of time and space that was created by God's command. This is out of the Phillips. That the world which we see right now comes into being through the principles which are invisible. I love that translation because he's saying, yes, the world, the universe was created as God spoke by faith. But specifically, I'm talking about your world that you live in right now, reaching your potential is going to be as you walk by faith as the grace gifts are being found. May you find grace every day and frame your new world around you. (laughs) Mom and dad were always poor, but you don't have to be poor. Sickness ran deep in your family, but you don't have to be sick. Sexual abuse ran through all that line, but it stops with you. Oh, yeah. This is good stuff, isn't it? So let me just encourage you. (laughs) This is not just teaching from the Bible. This is a reality of who you are in the body of the word Christ. And there is a life for you in the future that you have not lived yet. But my prophecy over you is that as you get up every day and you find your grace for that day, that God brings you into the favor of God and that you put one foot in front of the other and that though you have some adversity that you overcome every day, overcome, overcome, overcome. You're a winner, you're a champion. 
and God's gift is for you specifically, but you are a gift to all of us. Welcome to the body of Christ. You are not volunteers. You're part of a strong, healthy body. Everybody stand with me for just a moment. Father, we worship you tonight. We honor you and we give you praise and we thank you for your gift in us, creating us all special with a purpose and with a plan. You said through your scripture in 2 Timothy to stir up and to fan the flames of the gift on the inside of us. And may this be one of those nights that we're fanning the flame of the grace gift that belongs on the inside of us that you've gifted us with. Set us on fire, God. Let us touch our community. Let us change our community. Let's help one another, serve one another. Let's grow up, be disciplined, be mature, be servants. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.